There we go. Welcome. This is our first program in our fall series with the Camden Conference Community Events. I am Julia Pierce of the Camden Public Library, and I would like to turn the program over now to the president of the Camden Conference, Karen Look. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, uh, Julia, and welcome all of you here in the room and those of you on Zoom. Uh, I don't think I'm as at ease with this as Julia obviously <laughs> is, who is, you know, ready to take the stage thing, I think. Um, anyway, thank you for joining uh, me and uh, Jane Nice, the chairman of our uh, Community Events Committee, and of course our speaker, Sarah Rademacher, uh, here in the Canada Public Library. As uh, Julia said, for the first time uh, since the winter of 2020, if we all can think back there and we didn't even know what was coming. Um, it's really terrific of you to be here in person, and um, and I hope that that will be something that you do again and again this fall as the community events uh, calendar uh, moves ahead. Uh, our February 2023 topic is global trade and politics managing turbulence. And as we see in the news every single day, this turbulence is real. It's difficult to manage and affects all of us. Uh, from the impact of Putin's war on global trade and on grains, oil seeds and oil and gas to the green economy's pressing need for raw materials that are scattered <laughs> all over the planet, things like lithium and cobalt, and most certainly the just-in-time supply chain's impact on our daily lives. This topic couldn't be more relevant or ripe for discussion. I hope you'll consider joining us in February at the Camden Opera House um, for an in-person wonderful February uh, event, or if you wish, uh, at our venues um, in the mid coast and in Portland. So uh, let me turn it over to Jane and she will introduce Sarah. Hi, it is so nice to be back in person. It's hard to believe you're all real, not on Zoom. Everybody want to get out your computer, it's fine with me. But I do want to thank Julia again for being our excellent partner and hosting our first live event in two and a half years. Is that what, are we up to that? <laughs> anyway, I am Jan, uh, Jane Nice and part of this wonderful Camden Conference community and community events. So come look for us in a number of libraries up and down the coast from uh, Blue Hill on, on Southwest Harbor to the north, all the way down to Kenny Bunport and other Southern Maine, lots of Southern Maine libraries um, events. My pleasure tonight is to introduce Sarah Rademacher, founder, president of the American Unagi. <laughs> She's teaching me. I've got to get that t-shirt. There's no doubt that I will have to get a t-shirt that's on their website so I can remember how to say this. But it's what's exciting is a unique land-based American eel farm, and it's now in Walderboro, which is closer to my home turf. So I'm really glad it's it's there. You're there. Sarah's goal is to replace some of the 11 million pounds of farmed eel that is imported into the U.S. from around the world, most particularly in, in a that's in one year. Previously, most of that imported eel came from China, and it went into sushi restaurants, which, as you know, started to get really popular back in the 90s even. And it's gone, went into those sushi restaurants with consumers who didn't know where it was from, how it was farmed, and even if it was legal. So that was a lot of questions that nowadays are not uncommon questions. And the good news is we have the American Unagi company that can answer all of them. So Sarah's company taps into Maine's highly regulated, and you can find it all as I did today, looking it up, highly regulated, Ilver Fishery, uh, which is a spring event for those that work in that industry. And it's when the baby glass eels migrate from the Bermuda area all the way north up to the Maine's freshwater rivers to mature, which in the wild takes a long time. But I gather with the happy eels we have that are now in Waldeboro coming in, um, they mature a lot faster, which is another big plus for good um, good industry regulations that you do things that are sustainable and appropriate with these animals. 
on the company website. I highly recommend because I went through it today as I was learning about this company and Sarah's good work. You can see the whole process from glass elbers to fresh butterfly smoked um, process that can take a main fish delicacy around the world. We have some of our local restaurants that have it. So when you get to Suzuki's and other restaurants up and down the coast, you can try out some of that wonderful product and I highly recommend it. So please give a warm welcome to Sarah Robin. Thank you, everybody. I am pumped to be here and in person. This is my first public talk in a very long time. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. I mean, global uh, trade and politics is complicated. There's a lot of layers. Uh, and eels are a globally traded product that we have a unique connection to here in Maine. So with kind of the presentation, um, I'm gonna be doing some background detail on exactly you know, what we're doing with eels here and that connection. And I hope to um, have a more guided deep dive into the, the questions on global trade uh, once we're done with this presentation. So very excited to be here. So I started an eel farm here in Maine, uh, but I've been in the aquaculture industry for almost 20 years now. And aquaculture is really, where um, I kind of want to start the conversation in perspective. So this is a graph that, um, oh, can I get rid of this top screen? I don't know. If you hover it off to the side. All right, cool. Um, so this graph uh, is a really powerful graph to me. So this is seafood and aquaculture production in the world. Uh, the orange that you see in there is what is caught from our oceans. So it's the seafood being caught around the world. Uh, and since 2014, 50%, over 50% of the seafood that we're consuming globally is produced by aquaculture. So already aquaculture is a part of our lives um, and it's a growing part of our lives. So why is it um, and where is it happening? So globally aquaculture is going on we're, I think, 13th on the list here, um, with most of the production happening in India, Indonesia, and China is leading um, the growth of that industry. So we're hearing more about aquaculture, especially on the main coast, uh, because it is an important economic opportunity for the state. And the United States in general is looking at it as an important opportunity. We import as much as 90% of our seafood, despite having some of the largest coastlines uh, in the world. So for Maine, it is a unique opportunity to diversify our waterfronts. So right now, I mean, we have so much of our economy is tied up in lobster. When you drive up and down these coasts, that is what is holding up um, a lot of the industries uh, and a lot of the communities. But aquaculture is an opportunity to diversify our coast and create some more economic sustainability um, for the communities. And we have a lot of the infrastructure that is perfect for aquaculture, a lot of the skill sets. So you're seeing that push um, already. And uh, we already have uh, a leader in aquaculture with the shellfish industry, which has developed here over the last 30 years. And we have some of the best oysters, at least in my opinion, um, in the US. So you're seeing now kelp, mussels, uh, and then land-based aquaculture is also starting to show up. So why aquaculture? Seafood is one of the most efficient things that we produce. And as we look at food production systems and food systems, as we have a growing population and everybody realizes we have limited resources, doing things more efficiently in our food systems is gonna be really important for the future. And that comes down to thinking about what we're producing, how we're, we're producing it. And aquaculture is a really great protein to produce. In terms of resource usages, it is one of the most efficient. So this is a great graph that um, I like to talk about. So when we think about a cow, it takes 10 pounds of feed to produce one pound of meat. And when you think about that 10 pounds of feed, that's land, it's water, it's fuel, it might be producing grains, but that's still a large, large footprint. When you come down the line to a fish, um, it can be as little as one to one. So one pound of feed producing one pound of meat. 
Um, so that's one of the reasons that I'm a huge fan of aquaculture is it's efficient and I love that. So when you look at aquaculture, it's super diverse from what you can grow to how you can grow it. So one kind of easy way to look at it is there's extensive aquaculture down to intensive aquaculture. So as a farmer puts more effort into controlling the environment that their animal is growing in, it produces uh, more yield, higher yields, um, and better products. So oyster farms, for example, that you see around here. There's oyster farmers who just will spread out seed on a lease site, and then they'll come back later, maybe a couple of years, dredge it up or send a diver down. So for a couple of years, they're pretty hands-off, um, but they don't always have the nicest looking products. Sometimes they can get pests or um, issues. But say those farmers put the oysters in the surface um, up by the warm waters where the light is there and the feed is there, and they put them into um, the cages that you see sometimes along the coast. It shortens the growth time. It produces a product faster for the market. And you also take out pest risks and can have a healthier product. So a little more work on the farmer's part produces a better product. The highest yielding, so the most controlled environment are land-based aquaculture, but it also is one of the most intensive and highest, highest yielding um, forms of aquaculture. The other big thing where aquaculture differs is where you get your seed. So um, oyster hatcheries, for example, um, produce the seed for oyster farms. Uh, there are salmon farms get their, um, their seed from hatcheries. But there are still a lot of things that come from the wild. So scallop um, farming along the main coast that's developing, they go out and collect that spat from the wild. Mussel farms also go out and collect spat. And eel farms get our uh, juvenile eels from the wild. So all of that was to help explain eel aquaculture. So we are a capture-based intensive aquaculture. So our seed, comes from the wild. So we work with wild caught elvers um, or glass eels as they're often called. Those are then farm raised. And in our case, we're doing it in land-based recirculating systems. So everything's on land and controlled. And then we sell our products live or processed. So around the world, there are 18 different species of eels. So here on the main coast, we uh, work with Anguilla ristrata, it's referencing to its big nose. Um, but there are all these other species of eels that are also grown the same way that we grow ours. Uh, and four of them are really the top eel species. The number one most prized glass eel, Elver, is uh, Anguilla japonica along the Japanese um, and China coast. Anguilla anguilla is the European eel, and then we're considered kind of third on the list but uh, is Anguilla ristrata. And then there's a couple species down here around Australia. And then there's a bunch of warm water species in the um, Indonesia area. So um, much like that map you just saw, culturally eels are widely eaten and connected to traditions and recipes and cultures all over the world. Uh, one fascinating thing I have learned, because um, when I first got into eels, I didn't know a thing about them. It just seemed like a good fish. They, uh, I had no idea how diversely it was connected. Um, and pretty much since people have existed, um, eels have been eaten, eaten and a part of um, human kind of diet uh, for as long as we've been around campfires. So with that, I mean, there are regions and books and these beautiful stories about um, in like New Zealand, they're considered a god. Uh, in Japan, there's festivals where they eat eel, um, like we eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Um, there are totems in China where they, every year before the eel harvest, they sacrifice eels. So there are this long-standing relationship of eels and humans um, that is also ingrained in food and recipes. Um, so, you know, us as Americans, there's a lot of exposure to sushi, but as a mixing pot that America is, I get inquiries from Greek restaurants, from Italian restaurants for eel products that connect to all these other recipes. 
So a little bit about our eel um, and why it's unique, why it's sought after um, in this global uh, aquaculture industry. So eels uh, are all wild caught because they have a very complicated life cycle. Every single one of the eels that lands in the United States was born out in the Sargasso Sea, like literally by the Bermuda Triangle, which adds to the you know mystery. So no one has ever seen eels spawn in the wild. Um, it was only within the last hundred years that they even found out where they were spawning. Um, there's crazy stories about Pliny the Elder thinking that they just came out of the mud um, and all sorts of kind of ancient uh, ideas of where eels spawn from. So what happens is they go out here, they spawn, and then the juvenile eels known as leptocephali, they look like little tiny willow leaves, drift on the currents. They don't know if they're going to land in the Caribbean or all the way up here in Canada. What that means is that they have a massive natural range. Uh, so you can find our American eel species all along the coast. And that world map, those eel species can be found the same way. So eels are essentially all over the world. In the United States, uh, my hometown is uh, back here in Indiana. There's an eel river um, that has weirs that the Native Americans used to catch eels on. This is middle of the country um, and these fish exist. So huge, huge range. Um, our fishery for eels in the United States, uh, there's a fishery for the yellow eel stage, which is that adult eel stage, but it's only in Maine and South Carolina that they fish for the glass eels or the elvers. And this fishery, has become one of the most valuable fisheries per pound in the United States. One pound of glass eels goes for about $2,500. And it is because uh, these fish are sought after for the aquaculture industry, mostly um, in China. So the fishermen, you'll see these nets. Some of you might recognize these along the coast. The fishery is 10 weeks from the end of March until the beginning of April. And fishermen now have a regulated, highly regulated quota um, that's shaped. But the fishery really started to come um, in the 1970s in the US with the start of the aquaculture industry in China. Um, and our eel was uh, not the most sought after. In fact, it was a handful of fishermen. This woman is one of them who kind of heard about this eel fishery and the demand for eel and started fishing up and down the coast before any regulations existed. Um, the fishery has had a couple of booms and busts as uh, other eel species became prioritized. Uh, but now um, with the shutdown of the European um, eel fishery, our eel fishery jumped in value and this made headlines in 2012. Um, it went from being a few hundred dollars a pound up to 2,000 um, plus dollars. So these little babies are worth a lot, about a dollar a piece right now. So, um, so what's happening and what has been happening is our fishery here in Maine gets exported as the glass seals and then grown on farms abroad, um, mostly in a southern region, coastal region of China. Um, once those eels are full grown, more and more of them have been imported back for our sushi industry. So that's really taken off in, uh, since the early 2000s. I mean, now Hannaford has sushi. So you know, you're seeing this industry and this food um, uh, grow. And with that, more and more people are eating eel. And a lot of this is because eel is one of the few items in a sushi restaurant that's cooked. So many people, it's their starter sushi, uh, who don't want to eat something raw. It's like shrimp or eel. So um, we've gotten a lot of fans, and more and more again, eels are coming back into the U.S. Uh, part of the problem that has occurred is that eels are coming into China from all over um, the the country and, or excuse me, the world. So you're seeing um, all of these eels and all these different eel species are going into the farms in Asia um, and grown out and then imported back. The problem is that um, specifically with eels is that a lot of these fisheries are unregulated, not monitored, um, and have been fished very, very heavily. So 
this is one of the issues with some global trade is especially with natural resources is areas you know in the Caribbean uh, in Africa where there is almost no regulation uh, countries can come in take advantage of that and um, really remove a lot of a natural resource so what I looked at was an opportunity to cut out this and provide a product um, that has some more certainty in it, that you know it's from our regulated uh, eel fishery here in Maine, that is out of all these fisheries, our fishermen are under some of the strictest regulation. And that goes not only for our eel fishery, but across the board in a lot of our fisheries, our fishermen face really, really high regulations. We have some of the most monitored, um, likely the most sustainable fisheries in the, in the world. And yet um, a lot of times that's not recognized on the market. Um, so what we're looking to do is take that regulation and that fishery that's a lot more sustainable than any other and keep that traceability um, throughout the supply chain. And that also puts us into making a product that is unlike any that's out on the market. So when we take our eels from local fishermen, we grow them locally and we sell them almost entirely in the United States. Uh, it means that we are the only eel on the market globally that has that level of traceability, that has that level of a sustainable connection, um, and that isn't grown with antibiotics, banned chemicals, and hormones that are often used in farms abroad. So in shrinking the supply chain and keeping um, the eel here, for our customers, which um, as soon as I put up a website, I was blown away by the number of people who had taken eel off their menu because of the uncertainty of these imported products and who recognized the opportunity and wanted a product that they knew where it was coming from, um, how it was grown. So we kind of offer a product that has, um, you know, can't answer the questions of where it's from, how it was grown, and takes a lot of that question out. For Maine, keeping this connection here um, in the States, uh, it takes a fishery that's 10 weeks and adds an economic um, connection that is year round with our production. It's year round jobs. Uh, and it also, when we take a locally grown eel, we grow its value five to 10 times as much in keeping it here. So if you take a fishery that is as much as $27 million, um, it can grow that by 10 if you grew everything here. So that's a huge amount of opportunity for the state. For the US, producing eel locally reduces a little bit of that seafood deficit, that 90% that we're importing. So with our farm in Waldeboro, it's 240 metric tons. So half a million pounds of eels is what we're growing. That's only 6% of the US market. So we are taking a smidgen of those imports um, off the market with a local product. But there's a huge amount of benefits um, that, you know, I quite honestly didn't recognize when I put this business together and how changing the supply chain can impact the community. It's not just jobs, it's not just, you know, products and kind of traceability. Um, for our resource, uh, it has impacts. So, we are building consumer awareness and non-consumer awareness for those who don't eat eel about eels. You know, a lot of people don't realize that this is even a resource that's in our community and that it has this value that it's connected to these jobs. But it also, I'm getting constant opportunities to do things and connect to things that are beneficial to the species. We were, um, have, have been working with a company that builds fish turbines um, and they're building a more fish safe turbine and they test it with all these other species. They had never been able to test it with eel. So we sent them eels, they tested this fish turbine um, that will eventually improve um, fish's ability to pass through dams, which is a huge thing for fish like eel that is moving between um, the ocean and the sea or the, uh, the rivers in the sea. Um, we've also been approached on research efforts. So um, environmental DNA is something that um, fisheries regulators are trying to develop as a way to help assess populations. So we produce and given our, our fish water so that they can develop this strategy for monitoring the fishery. 
So uh, there's a lot of really great opportunities, not only to give back to the community, but to give back to the species and the resource to make sure that it continues to, to be sustainable. Um, so we produce a bunch of great products. Uh, one also great thing about uh, being in America is you are not tied to having to produce just one type of food. As we look at what was popular in Europe with smoked eel, uh, we produce a um, eel product that's used for kabiyaki, which is some of the traditional sushi preparations. And I couldn't help myself with the opportunity to produce a canned fish, which is a very uh, historical thing for me. Um, so we've been developing different products, uh, all tied to this really, really phenomenal fish. Um, so what I kind of wanted to do was let you guys lead a little bit of the questions as far as the global trade and politics, because you saw the eel species uh, list and it is, uh, people writing books on, on eels and the eel trade. And there's uh, a lot of stories um, and a lot of ways we can drive this conversation. So I figured I would let the questions lead uh, the rest of the conversation. And we certainly also invite the people on Zoom to please go ahead and type your questions into the chat box or into the Q&A and I'll read them aloud to Sarah. And Sarah, if you want to stop your share, then people can see your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to pull it up if we need some maps later. Sure. Um, sure. Um, are do you think that uh, uh, your or uh, your uh, company and and others in the U.S. are going to be setting a, an example for the world as far as the kind of quality product you know where it isn't uh, it isn't contaminated with hormones or or other things or has the is the rest of the uh, Renagi uh, Producers out there, many, many of them in the rest of the world, are are they going to be oblivious to the small, you know, work because we're a small startup uh, yeah. operation? No, that's that's a really great question. Um, I had no idea how good eel could be, um, <laughs> and that's one of those things too. Is that sometimes I think with products is you don't realize the low standard that you're oftentimes getting until you have something better, um, and about every single chef that I have given our product to has like made some sort of comment about, I didn't realize how good eel could be. And um, so absolutely, I think we are changing the standard and, and shifting the perspective on, on product quality through this. Yep. Uh, this is more personal, I guess, but I'm interested in how a woman from Indiana, first of all, gets interested in agriculture. And that's, I'm not being tonight about Indiana, I've lived there. Ah. And, and then how did you get the training, education, whatever, to, to have the confidence to form your own business? Uh, well, I, I grew up, um, I, my family has businesses and my, I grew up, my grandmother had a foundry uh, that she ran. So I didn't really think twice about running my own business at some point. Focusing on aquaculture um, was, you know, the forks in the road that sometimes leads you where you never expect to be. But I ended up going to Auburn University down in Alabama and really learned what that industry was. Saw it as something that was super challenging, but also, um, you know, I saw that map, that first graph I showed you a long time ago. So this, an aquaculture, has been one of the fastest growing food sector industries in, in the world. So I knew that if I chose that, I wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't, would always have something to do. So, uh, I spent, yeah, I spent about 10 years uh, working for different businesses around the world um, with aquaculture before I uh, came into Maine and wanted to settle in here. And what about Maine? Maine? Oh, here. Uh, AmeriCorps volunteer <laughs> down in Port Clyde. So I am a huge uh, supporter of AmeriCorps. I, I think it, it's something that brings a lot of young people and gets people exposed to the Maine coast. And yeah, down I ended up in Port Clyde. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'll comment on the question. First, uh, that you're taking the product and eliminate the back and forth. When you think about the, the transportation, the cost, the fuel, and everything else, 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and now the comment. And, and, and it says, a result of the discussion I had with my son on salmon farming just a couple of days ago. Uh, and do you have to flush your beds with from waste where you're growing? So we reuse 90% of our water within the system. Mm -hmm. um, one nice thing with eel farms, and one of the reasons I chose it, is that you um, eels are one of the most efficient things you can grow um, on a land-based farm. So we grow, um, our facility grows half a million pounds. It's 227,000 square feet. So we have our own waste treatment that's essentially, um, it's, to the caliber that uh, a town treats their water, but we release about a garden garden hose worth of water. So we cleaned up, and I saw my engineer drank it. So <laughs> good. So so yeah, that's definitely something when I think about um, aquaculture and finding the right fit. It's it's choosing um, a fish that makes sense for the coast and the connection, but also thinking about size and uh, resource usage is a big thing. Thanks. Yeah, Lillian has a question. Oh, I've got a question that's coming from Zoom and it's similar to what was just asked, but uh, Joan wants to know about, um, you know, what in particular about Maine makes this an ideal place for eel aquaculture and do you have plans to expand beyond Maine? Um, yeah, no, I, uh, well, a couple of things. Maine, um, I think, like I mentioned in the beginning, is um, is a great place for aquaculture. Um, there's a lot of synergies between the fisheries, and specifically with eels, we are one of the only states with an eel fishery. So, um, in terms of a connection and an understanding of the value proposition of this business, Maine understands that if we keep a little portion of these glass eels here, the economic value and connection to this fishery is hugely beneficial to the community. So um, it just, yeah, it made a lot of sense. I looked at a lot of different fish and eels, eels won me over. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I was in agriculture for 20 plus years, so I've got some technical stuff. Nice. <laughs> Serenities, food, uh -huh. temperatures. Yep. How long does it take? Can you touch upon all that? <laughs> Top secret. <laughs> That's all I need to know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's they're they're one of I, I will say this. Um out of all of the fish that I've worked with in the species, they are one of the hardiest. And they're one of the few that have been done successfully in land-based aquaculture for 40 years. So it says a lot about that. Um and Anybody who's ever caught a eel in the wild can also tell you how hardy they are. And that makes them really great for, for growing. So does it take two, three years to put out the product or one year? Or... It depends. Uh, sometimes eels, because you're, you're getting your seed from the wild, you have some of those eels that reach market size in seven months and some that take two years. Oh. So, yeah. 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 Hi, a, a question on... on water changes with the climate change mm. that we see that with a lot of things especially lobster moving north and a lot of other species of fish are also moving north because it's getting warmer here yep. so are eels particularly sensitive to that and therefore moving or do you concerned about that I mean, no that's that's a really good question and that was actually one of the things when i first looked at um the species being from aquaculture not yeah. from fisheries i honestly was a little bit hesitant with being fishery dependent yeah. because we're in a changing world because we've all seen issues with fisheries um what um stood out to me about eels is that they exist the, their their natural range is from the caribbean to um, like Greenland. So in terms of a species that can handle anything and you know pH, temperature, salinity, like there's a whole portion of the natural population of eels that lives in salt water that nobody's ever even counted. So uh, they are really, really hardy. Um, and I I hate to say I'm not I, I don't, I'm gonna say it, but they're you know 
they're like a cockroach. Like they'll be around. <laughs> yeah, not uh, yeah. I, they are they are very adaptable, so they'll be here. Um, yep. Sarah, your eels are your elvers are coming out of the salt water, heading for fresh water. Do you raise them in fresh or salt or something in between? We can do it all. Um, so the European farms uh, that were modeled off of use fresh water. So that's what we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the Chinese eat cockroaches, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, One of the compelling things about your business model is taking that huge piece of the transportation thing mm -hmm. out of the system. Yeah. Uh, was there much yield? Are these things so hardy that there wasn't much yield loss with transportation, or is that another benefit you've got? That's another uh, benefit. So when you think about um, transporting a live organism, yeah, you know, our eel fisheries are handled by our fishermen. They then go to buyers. They then are transported overseas, mostly to, um, there's a lot of fish houses that are exist in Hong Kong. And then from there, they go out to China. Um, so every single time um, those fish are weighed, counted, handled, there's loss. Um, sometimes it can be 10%, sometimes it can be 50%. So when with us, it goes from the fishermen to our farm. So there's one interaction um, and we actually work very closely with a lot of our fishermen to help improve small things that they can do to make that survival even better um, and that loss. So. That's a huge, in terms of, again, resource use and cost. Um, by the time those eels, if there's everybody takes a cut, there's losses. By the time they get over into those farms, they can be more than double um, to those farms than what we pay. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of little things that um, that also adds up on. I'm gonna jump in with a couple questions yeah. that are coming in from Zoom. Um, so Bill wants to know, how many pounds of glass eels do you bring in annually to sustain the eel farm? Yeah, that was um, also a big consideration in choosing a farm size and a location is we only need about 600 pounds of glass in the world. <laughs> and that's about 6% of Maine's quota. So very reasonable, um, small piece to produce half a million pounds of eels as a final product. And Libby wants to know, what is market size? So how large do the eels get? Yeah, um, so market size is anywhere from a quarter pound to a pound. Um, and a lot of that depends on the market. So eels are eaten globally, different cultures, different recipes call for different size eels. So uh, we make that work. <laughs> we have one more question here uh, from Dorothy. How many species of eel will Maine be involved with? Will it be the dominant type of eel used for Yunagi in Japan? So our um, what we exclusively work with is our American eel, which is Anguilla ristrata. Um, and that is, you know, one of the things that I think is important is, is just using that species for our farms. Um, Globally, uh, you'll see other eel species grown and used, uh, but we're focused exclusively on the American eel. Thank you. Yep. Are you required to use Maine eels, or can you, because of present regulations, or can you go to South Carolina just to diversify your population? Or, or? Um, that's a good question. I want to work exclusively with Maine eels and the Maine fishery, mm -hmm. but the it's the same eel species down there. Okay, so, so it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Yes. What makes the Japanese eel number one versus like us number three? Like, <laughs> what what the classification of eel? Uh, like, um, <laughs> yeah. No, there's uh, supposedly there's a lot of differences. Um, skin texture. Uh, fat content, but um, I will say I have given our eels to some of the top Japanese chefs in the U.S., and we got a thumbs up that ours is just as good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's I think it's partly um, there was a preference because that was nearest um, and created a product that that was the first eel that was farmed in China and in Japan. Um, so that's what they're used to, and it gets the number one, um, especially in Japan. Uh, it's there's food traditions, and and there's specifics on this is the eel you use. So, um, I like mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yep. Do you have a list on your website 
of sushi restaurants that serve your products? I don't yet, but we we are just revamping our website, and that's going to be one of the tabs. Yeah, that would be neat. Well, yeah. what that's a very important question that ties into Donna's. Uh, what can you please remind us what your website address is? Yeah. And more importantly, do you sell fresh mature eel direct to consumers? Good questions. Uh, it's AmericanUnagi.com, and we sell our fillets, which are frozen, uh, but you couldn't tell the difference between fresh and frozen with our product because it is frozen immediately and processed within a within hours of pulling them out of the tanks. Uh, we sell our smoked product and then our canned deal. I think that's all we have that's coming cool. uh, through through Zoom. Anyone else have last questions in the audience before we wrap up? Oh. Um, you should tell folks they can get them at Jess's yes. in yes. Rockland and then Suzuki yep. has your product. I yes. don't know if there's anybody else. But. Um, Suzuki carries our product. Jess's, uh, we're um, Morris's sauerkraut. Um, the Damerscata um, co-op um, will be carrying our products. Uh, and yeah, right from our website. Suzuki's, yeah, yeah she's been doing um, our eels. Uh, occasionally it makes an appearance at Sammy's and uh, <laughs> at uh, Wolf Peach. So yeah, um, yeah there's- Harbor fish and there's a harbor fish. Yep, yeah. they usually um, definitely in the fall um, have our smoked eel for the holidays. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had, had smoked eel, but that is, I was blown away by it. I grew up in Indiana. I didn't eat fish and I eat eel. So, yep. This one uh, question. Uh, did you get any of the uh, sort of uh, attention or pushback that the salmon farms have been getting? Uh, for, you know, onshore fishery? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. We actually didn't. Um, and I think for a couple of reasons. One is I, I, built relationships in the town in Walderboro and um, and built connection into the community before I even was sure that we were gonna go there. Um, but also it's eels. And I think that it's important, you know, with, with our fish, it already has a deep connection to the coast of Maine. So people see a value in having this aquaculture portion connected. It makes a lot of sense. Um, we also aren't building massive facilities, which I think is also um, a big thing that, uh, you know, I, I think puts us in a different category um, than some of the salmon farms. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all out there for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for your patience with any weird uh, tech glitches you might have seen. We'll get better and better the more we do this. Um, again, please check libraryCamden.org for information about our programs and CamdenConference.org for information about all the fun programs they have coming up. All right. And of course, AmericanUnagi.com so you can find out what's going on with Sarah and her amazing innovative company. Have a great night, everyone. And we hope to see you again in person and on Zoom. Good night.